that the, the doctrinal teaching was, was novel there or difficult, but that every passage seemed to be a springboard for preaching. And so we were preaching for a good year in 2 Timothy, exhorting us to faithfulness and exhorting us to press on and preach the word and, and to be faithful and fight the good fight and, and study a source of the proof and things like this. Uh, now we're going back to the beginning. We have, at, at this point, uh, I'm going to get a little history here of our verse-by-verse -verse studies. I've gone through all of Paul's epistles, verse-by-verse, -verse, and so we're going back to Romans now. This is the second time we're recording it. It's the fourth time I've taught through it, uh, the book of Romans. And it's a foundational book. Uh, to study. And so as we do in every epistle, in every book study that we do, we start with an introductory lesson, and we're going to ask tonight the purpose of why we're studying Romans. We'll cover the Romans outline, maybe we'll cover some book details, and then uh, we may or may not start verse by verse next week, uh, depending if I want to do a second introduction or not. It is such a, a magnificent book, and there's so much to talk about, uh, that I'm still struggling a little bit about how fast to go through it. Uh, there are some uh, 433 verses, 16 chapters, and 9,422 words in the book. That's much longer than 2 Timothy, which is only four chapters, and we spent 50 weeks on that. So, you know, you do the math there. But um, meanwhile, uh, there's a lot that can be said in Romans, and when you start going back to reteach Romans, the thing that made me a little nervous was if I already taught it, it's on the website even. You can go back and see 69 lessons in Romans, and I've got outlines there and everything. What else is there to teach? Well, when you go back to the Bible and study things again, especially after 10 and 11 years, you realize there's more there, and there's things that you miss. There's things that uh, you've grown in. There's, uh, there's many reasons to go back and study it. So it's really self-evident when you ask the question, why are we studying Romans? It should be self-evident. Romans is the chief doctrinal book in the Bible. It is, uh, hopefully, unarguably, the greatest book in the Bible. And that's not a hyperbole. Uh, that's if you were to evaluate the important significance of every book in the Bible. And the whole Bible is important, all Scripture being inspired of God. Romans stands at the top. It's not Revelation. It's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's Romans. Because Romans explains the gospel of salvation. It lays the foundation of the gospel, the doctrine, position, and walk of the church today. Uh, much like uh, Schofield said in his notes in Ephesians 3, in his Bible 100 years ago or so, he said the doctrine, walk, and position for the church are found in Paul's epistles alone. And you can't help but read that. He wrote that in Ephesians in his notes. But to think, well, you know what? Romans is really the cause of that. Because you take Romans out of your Bible, and you're missing a lot. Okay, you're missing a lot of foundational doctrine and understanding of what Christ did for your salvation, who you are in Christ, how do you walk after the Spirit, all that, gone. What happened to Israel? Gone. Uh, practical instructions and behavior and, uh, that define your service, reasonable service? Gone. And so you definitely, in the books of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and 2 Timothy, you find the high fruit and you find things that are, 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 are high spiritual understandings. But in Romans, you have a foundation. Without that, you cannot grow. It is the seed from which we grow in, in the Christian life. So it's so important. And so why are we studying Romans? Well, because it's been too long, way too long. It's been 11 years since we've been in the book, and now we're returning. And repetition is a good thing. It's a good thing because there's new people. Uh, I remember teaching Romans before, and uh, there's new people my wife being one of them. <laughs> it's a, it's one of the, there's new people to hear, hear the book study. There's new ministries out there. There's new ministers who, going back again to established churches, establish their Bible studies, need to hear this material. Uh, there's growth that we've gone through. If you've been here that long, we've grown. And so you come back and see it with eyes of growth, and you say, wow, there's even more, because the Bible is endless like that. It's not that you read it once and say, that's it. Since it's the Word of God, it's, a, it's living and powerful and it teaches and grows you, you come back to it, and there's still more there to teach and grow you. And so it really is an endless supply of edification. Uh, there's also new heresies, uh, which aren't new really, but they keep coming back up, and new things that are different than before. So, so one way that we're going to see you deal with wrong doctrine and heresies is go back to the foundation. That's always how you do it. Heresies are created in the fringe and in the dark corners of things. And if you want to know, well, where did they get wrong? Well, go back to the basics, to the foundation. Romans is that. So if we're going back to Romans, we're going to try to settle some of those. And some of them even taught from the book. So that's why we're studying the book of Romans. Like I said before, it's foundational to our understanding of who we are in Christ, of salvation. 
of who the, what the church is and of our position and walk, all of this is found in Romans. Our understanding of Romans changes and will change the future course of how you grow or more at large, how the church functions. When the church does not preach or emphasize the book of Romans, it will be to its detriment. It will be uh, to its lack of success. It will be to, to a weakness as a result. Uh, to the degree that the church emphasizes the book of Romans, the doctrines contained in it, and establish those doctrines, it will be stronger. It will function properly. And you'll have people that mature in the faith. And so uh, you, can, you can judge history in the church based on how close and, and, and strong they align themselves with the book of Romans. And maybe the most significant historical shift of that is Martin Luther and the Reformation, which Martin Luther was a Catholic. And then he read Romans. And he read Romans and said, wait a minute, I'm justified by faith? That's it? Faith? And it's like, it's not all these other things that justify me. And uh, Romans really kicked him out of Catholicism and uh, saved him and got him the gospel of the grace of God. And that started a reformation and then a revolution of people reading and studying their Bible to find what else did the church get wrong. Yeah. Because they went back to the foundation of salvation, which was in Romans. It wasn't in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was in Romans. We've been studying on our Sunday lessons how we need Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to understand Jesus according to the flesh, and understand God manifest in the flesh, and many other things. But Romans is the foundational book that God inspired for the church. So you can see through history, the closer people are to Paul, specifically Romans, but Paul's, Paul's epistles, is where you're going to find growth and strength uh, in the Lord. Okay? Um, its focus, the focus of the book of Romans, is on the mystery of Christ. Now, th this, I say this at the beginning because we'll see this as we study through it, but there are people who, because they don't study it carefully, think the mystery is not in the book of Romans, even though at the very end of the book you definitely find Paul talking about preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. There's that. That's at the very end of the book, however. But that's not because he just began to mention it. it. We'll see through Romans, he's laying a foundation of the mystery of Christ. Okay? He, he only alludes to it in Ephesians, where he hearkens back to the mystery that I've written before. And then he expounds on and builds upon the foundation he's laid already. And so it's not that Romans is, is void of mystery truth and mystery revelation, and it's only later that he adds that as the cherry on top. It's a foundation of mystery truth. Without that, you're really going to have a trouble maintaining uh, the Bible rightly divided. And we see that over and over again um, when, when people depart from the book of Romans, even the other direction. Some people depart to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Other people depart to Acts 28. Both of them are departing from Romans and Paul's epistle. So Paul's focus in this book is on the mystery of Christ instead of the history of Christ. Uh, and that is found, of course, as we're studying in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. His history is uh, before uh, he rose from the dead and before he revealed the mystery to Paul. So, the book of Romans has been called the purest gospel, and it's responsible for saving more people than any other book or man in history. Any other book of the Bible, any other preacher in history, Romans is responsible for saving more people. Uh, just, just one email testimony I can give you um, is, I, says, I was saved by the grace of God by reading the letter to the Romans and believing the gospel of Christ outside of any Christian denomination. He went on to explain the rest of his testimony, but that was just one of many I've received, uh, but that's because the gospel's there. We, we exhort you when you're trying to minister to people, and they say, where do I begin in the Bible? Romans. I mean, you, should, you should read all of the Bible, but Romans is if you're trying to establish yourself as a Christian, read Romans, the first eight chapters, over and over again, until you can uh, summarize that and explain it pretty well. Uh, you won't know everything in it, but you'll need to know those truths. Okay. Martin Luther, in his commentary on Romans, says, it's the true masterpiece of the New Testament, the very purest gospel, which is well worth and deserving, that a Christian man should not only learn it by heart, word for word, you thought you should memorize it, uh, but also that he should daily deal with it as the daily bread of men's souls. For it can never be too much or too well read or studied, and the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes, and the better it tastes. That's a good reason to teach it again, I think. In fact, uh, as I've been preparing for Romans and You've been in the conversations with me between our lessons about whether we should do Romans or First John and other things, and uh, eventually decided we need to do Romans. It's, it's time again. Uh, I got to thinking how important the book is, reminding myself how important it is, and uh, we really shouldn't be so far away from Romans. We who rightly divide uh, 
who preach Christ according to Revelation of the Mystery should be teaching Romans consistently. And uh, not just the verse by verse as we'll do on Tuesdays, but one thought I had was in the future, um, perhaps teaching through you know, chapters of Romans every year on Sunday. Uh, you know, so, so every year we'll get Romans. We need to be established in that book. We, we need to know it in and out. Just like we know dispensational charts, we need to know Romans. Because yeah. that is, is, is a part of the sword there, the spirit, that, we, that will be at the tip of the spear. So uh, Martin Luther said we should know it by heart. And so just like you would know a dispensational chart by memory, because we've drawn it so many times, you, you can somewhat draw a, a vague chart of the Bible. You should know Romans uh, by heart. You should be able to say, well, what's in Romans 5? What's in Romans 6? What's in Romans 7? And, and, how, and what's he saying there generally? Okay, so we'll be probably doing that in the future as well. But we'll start with that verse by verse again. Uh, Arno Gabeline, who was a dispensationalist of the early 20th century, said, many have but a hazy view of justification and have little or no knowledge of a settled peace with God and lack the assurance of salvation. They are constantly striving to be something and to attain something which God in an infinite grace has already supplied in the gospel of his Son. Even if we have grasped the great doctrines of salvation as revealed in Romans, it is needful that we go over them again and again. No Christian can enjoy the gospel and no true deliverance unless he knows the precious arguments of the first eight chapters of this book. So again, this is not some new thing we're inventing here. This has been known by Christians, at least those who know the gospel, that Romans is such an important book. The fact that perhaps you have not heard that before if you have indeed not heard it before, it shows you how far away the church is removed from where they need to be in Scripture. Even John Calvin, which we won't be teaching Romans uh, from his perspective necessarily, but just see how widely recognized and, and appreciated it is. John Calvin says, when anyone gains a knowledge of, of Romans, of this book, he has an entrance open to him to all the most hidden treasures of Scripture. And so we'll be correcting some of John Calvin's interpretations, but um, he definitely recognized the significance of the book. Uh, Romans is the foundation for salvation. It's the, the fountainhead of the dispensation of the grace of God. It's the beginning of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrines contained in it. Uh, it's the revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We talk about Christ's finished work. It's found in Romans. Show, show us where else in Paul's epistles it talks about the, this type of teaching of the finished work and nothing else. You'll find a verse here and a verse there, but it's explained in the book of Romans. Okay. It's the power of God in the book of Romans. Romans 1.16 says it's the power of God into salvation. Right? It establishes the believer on the gospel, the grace of God, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation of the Mystery. And so it's very odd then that before he became president in 2008, uh, then-candidate Barack Obama, in defending same-sex civil unions, he said, uh, if people find that controversial, that controversial, then I would just refer them to the Sermon on the Mount which I think is in my mind, for my faith, more central than an obscure passage in Romans, which he refers then to a passage in Romans which condemns homosexuality in Romans chapter 1. And he said, well, that's an obscure book. Go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the central message of Christianity. Now, he's not a great theologian, a law professor, but not a theologian. Uh, but again, it shows you just culturally people accepted not the homosexual argument, but the idea that, oh, yeah, okay, I guess Romans is obscure. Who's heard of that? We've heard of the Lord's Prayer. We've heard of the Great Commission. We've heard of him feeding the, the thousands and walking on the water. We've heard that. Romans, nobody knows what Romans is about. Unless you're a saved Christian that knows that's where the gospel is at Amen. in the book of Romans. So, so this is the importance of the book and why we're studying it. Okay. So let's start with an outline. I normally save outlines of our books to the end of our introductory lesson, but I, I really want to cover this as the main point of the lesson today because needing to know the arguments in Romans, what's contained in it, is so important since the book itself is, is so essential for understanding. Romans is, is very neatly divided, and again, this is not uh, much argued or disputed, uh, between three main sections. It's chapters 1 through 8, and then 9 through 11, and then chapters 12 through 16. And again, this is, this is very easy to understand, which even adds to the importance of the book. It's not a book like 2 Corinthians or, or some others in the Bible, Hebrews is kind of difficult, or even 2 Timothy, where it's, it's sometimes hard to divide it up into sections because it's more of an exhortation or just a general rebuke. Romans is a doctrinal treatise establishing the teachings of the church. And so it's very neatly divided up into argumentations and teachings that you could, you could split very easily. The first eight chapters then uh, refer to the doctrine of salvation, the gospel 
of Christ, the gospel, the grace of God, the gospel of God, all those referring to the same thing. Uh, Jesus Christ being God, God dispensing grace, it's our salvation. We might deal with that in a couple weeks in Romans chapter 1, where Paul said he was separated unto the gospel of God. And then in Romans 1, 16, he says he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. In Romans 15, where he says he went everywhere preaching the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ, which he calls the same thing in Romans 15. Uh, it's, it's the message that Paul is preaching that he's laying out in Romans here. Okay? In Romans 9 through 11, there's an interlude where he ends his, his teaching on salvation and our position and all that. In Romans 9 through 11, an interlude concerning Israel's salvation. And so, as Paul is explaining his salvation, which we'll explain here in a little bit, uh, in Romans 1 through 8, the question naturally comes as he's preaching the mystery of Christ and the gospel according to the mystery is what about the prophetic message? What about that salvation that was supposed to come through Israel? Because Romans 1 through 8 will we'll talk about that there's no, it's all men and there's no difference. And it's, it's a worldwide, doesn't exclude anyone from this salvation. You don't even need Israel. You don't need their covenants. And uh, that's all in Romans 1 through 8. Romans 9 through 11 then answers the question, what about Israel then? They seem to have a significant por portion of the inspired scripture up to Romans. And so he deals with them and their salvation. Uh, is, Romans chapter 9 is the election of Israel and the teaching of election, not as it pertains to everyone who's ever saved, but Israel's salvation is what Romans 9 deals with. That's where Calvin dropped the ball. And, uh, and how Israel was elect and how God would give them a promise and how that promise is passed down to the children and how not everyone who's part of Israel's family ends up becoming recipients of the promise and how that is. Romans chapter 10 deals with how Israel rejected Jesus Christ and how they, they stumbled over that, that stumbling stone and they didn't have faith. Uh, as we've been talking about in our Sunday lessons, Jesus came in the flesh in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for them to see God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God, the Messiah, Emmanuel, and they rejected him. And so Romans chapter 10 deals with their rejection of him and how they didn't have excuse, and how they could have known or should have known who he was. They didn't know the mystery. There's no way they could. They didn't know the teaching of Paul's gospel of salvation. There's no way they could. But they could know who he was in the flesh because that was all prophesied. Amen. Romans chapter 11, Paul ends this section with the, the remnant of Israel. And how even though Israel rejected him, there's a remnant of Israel, those that do believe, a, 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 that remain in the nation, and a return of the nation uh, at some point in the future from Romans 11 where Israel will be saved. All of Israel shall be saved. And so Romans 11 is about the remnant and their return or their restoration. So that's a nice little interlude there describing Israel's salvation after Paul just got describing salvation for all today and, and what's going to happen to their prophetic purpose. Some people call the middle section there the dispensational section uh, only because it's dealing with Israel and it, it seems to be describing the dispensational consequence of this mystery interrupting what was going on with Israel's prophetic program. And so, uh, Romans 12 through 16, the, the last section here is our reasonable service. And Romans 12, 1 and 2, if you remember the verse there, Paul talks about uh, presenting our bodies, a living sacrifice, and, and proving the acceptable, the, the, the perfect will of the Lord. Um, and, and it's our reasonable service to do that. And so, you, you can divide up those last uh, five chapters there under that, that heading of our reasonable service, or grace behavior, if you will. A practical instructions. It's, it's how do you apply what we've learned in Romans 1 through 8, right, in Romans 12 through 16. And so it's, what's your reasonable service, for example, in Romans 12, as members, is what he teaches, as members of one another, as members of one body. And then he goes on to explain how you use that understanding to treat other people in the body or out of the body in Romans 12, as members of one of another. Or Romans 13, what's your reasonable service as subject to higher powers? So there's authorities and governments. Well, what about that? Well, you're as subject to higher powers. And he starts the argument with all powers that be are subject to God, ordained by God. And so, so are we. And so just because we are not under the law and, and we are made free and set free from those things, we're not Israel, don't need that. We're not an earthly kingdom. We're above all principalities and powers in Colossians 1. Uh, we're subject to higher powers, God being the highest power. And so he makes the argument in Romans 13. What's your reasonable service when it comes to other people that just simply don't know the truth? Those ignorant fools. Uh, well, Romans 14, uh, as strong to the weak. And so Romans 14, he's talking to the strong. And how, how do you serve 
the weak. And he tells them to serve and to receive them and how to serve them and how to, how to deal and respond to them. Romans 15 continues that a little bit, talking about receiving people who don't know what you know. And there may be things you can learn from them in Romans 15, the them in Romans 15 being the remnant of Israel. And so in Romans 15, he talks about your reasonable service as ministers of Christ to both Jew and Gentile. So there's the ministry of Christ that was to the circumcision. There's a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. And we're all to be together in one to the glory of God in Christ. And that's Romans 15. So even though there's divisions there between God's purpose and, and programs and what he's, he's done, uh, Paul's explaining that we should receive one another in one, all giving glory to God. And so there's, there's the ultimate unity of the teaching of the gospel of grace of God is that we all give glory to God based on what he's done. Right? Now, of course, that, that's based on the premise that you know Jesus Christ and what he's done. But Romans 15, he teaches that. And of course, that last chapter, which half of it is just a list of names, but it's not just a list of names. It's a list of faithful servants. It's a list of established saints. And that's what he's doing there. He's pointing out to the Romans who are in disarray there of how to be established and who's right and who's wrong. And Paul's trying to lay this foundation. He says, well, here's some people that you should greet and you should acknowledge and maybe you should go to their church. And he mentions those in Romans 16 as established servants of the Lord. So you can see here, after understanding the first eight chapters of doctrine and then understanding how God was not lying about Israel and how he's going to fulfill their promises, Romans 12 to 16, you then know your reasonable service as members of one another, as subject to higher powers and government authorities, as strong to the weak, as ministers of Christ to all, and as established servants of the Lord. And so you can see in, in Romans here the seed of what will end up growing into, like, say, the epistle of 2 Timothy which is all about established servants of the Lord, right? Second Timothy was to Timothy, the established servant, a faithful workman, and trying to exhort him to continue that work. Well, that's, that's way over Romans 16, right? You know, he, Timothy already knew Romans 1 through 8, 9 through 11. He, he knew that, you know, so he was one of those established saints that he would write about. And you can you see the book of Ephesians. When, when you read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, you see the doctrines in there. You go to the Ephesians and say, well, there's so much greater mystery truths in Ephesians. Yes, but they were in seed form in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. And you can find them there. And so there's those sections. Now, I know I skipped uh, uh, Romans 1 through 8. And some of you are going, you skipped the best part of Romans. Well, yes and no. Uh, on the back of your outline here, I have, um, I have that quote from A.C. Gabeline that I just read about the first eight chapters of the book. And I also have a, a list of about 10 different summaries of how you could split up those eight chapters. They all, they're, it's all speaking of the same things. There's just different ways you can think about it. And so I want to draw up here for us the, the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. And even, as I said before, the book of Romans can be divided up neatly into three sections. Romans 1 through 8, 9 through 11, 12 through 16. We've covered these two final sections, this part being about Israel's salvation. And this part being about our reasonable service the application of our renewed mind. And in Romans 1 through 8, this first section, uh, the most significant section in Romans, where the foundation bricks are actually laid down, is about your mind being renewed. It's about your salvation. It's about all these things. Okay? Romans 1 through 3 could be said to be talking about the subject of how we're all under sin. Romans 1 through 3. And then you have 3 through 5. And then you have 6 through, through 8. I definitely didn't do that justice. You have 6 through 8. You have these three sections here. And 1 through 3, talking about how we're all under sin. That's the argument Paul makes. Romans chapter 1, he talks about how the, that they hold the truth in unrighteousness. And the, the last uh, half of Romans chapter 1 is him listing how God gave them over to a reprobate mind, and here's what they were doing that were, were sins, proving that the Gentiles from the beginning of the world uh, were full of sin. In Romans chapter 2, he makes the argument to those who have the law, which are Jews. And he says they have the law, they were given the law, and they broke the law too. So just because you thought you were a judge or holier than someone else doesn't mean you are perfect and you're a sinner too. So Romans 2 makes that argument. Romans 3 ends up saying, so there's none righteous. No, not one. You know, and and for, for, for all are sinners. And so Romans 3, 1 through 3, is that all are under sin. The doctrine of condemnation. Romans 3 through 5 is salvation in Christ. So here's where we find salvation. The, the actual explanation of salvation. Or the doctrines of justification. Which is how 
how do we, uh, how are we declared righteous before God? Uh, justification. Romans 3, uh, verse 21 speaks about no man can be justified by the law. And yet, Romans 3 will talk about being justified by the faith of Christ. Now, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And so we see salvation explained here in this important section, Romans 3, 22 through 27, and how that operates by grace. Romans 4, verse 5, deals with how it could be by faith. How in the world could justification be by faith, which was stated in Romans 3. Romans 4 explains that. To him that worketh not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is kind of a righteousness. Well, yeah, well, how is that possible? Romans 4 explains how it's not without precedent in the Scripture, and it's not without reason and righteousness in Romans 4. Romans 5, verse 1 concludes, Therefore, this being the verse that Martin Luther anchored himself to, the argumentation, Romans 3, 4, and 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see from Romans 3 to Romans 5 here, this teaching of the salvation in Christ. How you go from we're all sinners to we're justified freely by His grace through the redemption is in Christ Jesus and justified by faith. Therefore, we have peace with God, Romans 5, verse 1. Which leaves the, the final section, Romans chapter 5 through 8 or Romans chapter 6 through 8, which deals with our identity. We've had a seminar about, seminars about this. Our identity with Christ or the doctrine of sanctification. Or you've heard us talk about your position in Christ or who you are in Christ. Well, this is all in Romans 5 through 8, okay? Who you are in Him and, uh, and how He identifies you and how that's been changed. Romans 6 verse 4 says you've been baptized into Christ and you've been crucified with Him, you've been risen with Him. Uh, Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You have a position. You have blessings and gifts granted to you by virtue of the fact that you are now something else. You are a member of, of his body. You're a son of God. You're all of these things. And this is all described in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. <clears throat> Ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And he goes on to describe this. He says later that you're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Well, how do you know that the Spirit of God dwells in you? How do you know if you're Christ? Well, that's back here in Romans 3 through 5. You get saved and suddenly, now it's talking about now who you are you, now that you're saved. Romans 6, 7, and 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, how do I know I have the Spirit of God? Well, you're going back to Romans 3, 4, and 5 to figure out whether you're in Christ or not. I, I, I don't know I got that. And so, all under sin, Romans 1 through 3, salvation from sin, 3 four, through 5, and your identity, your position in Christ now, your sanctification in Him. So on the back of your outline there, I have many other ways to explain these same three sections in Romans 1 through 8. Romans 1 through 3, Romans 3 through 5, and Romans 5 through 8. Uh, the first time I might bring up here just a different way to think about this part of the book of Romans is, is similar to how we draw dispensational charts. Uh, he's not drawing a dispensational chart, but in one sense, he's going through the history of how God has been teaching humanity in the Bible. And that's what the Bible is. That's what we do when we draw dispensational charts. It's not simply, here's boring history and the random chronological events. God had a purpose from before the world began. Amen. And as he's doing things in history and revealing things through the prophets to humanity, he's teaching things. And so he teaches something through Adam and Eve. He teaches something through the promise given to Abraham. He teaches something by giving the law to Moses and creating the nation of Israel. And of course, Romans 3 explains that, you know, the, by the laws, the knowledge of sin. So he's teaching what sin is by giving that law and how we can't keep it. You know, he teaches things by Christ coming in the flesh and then his own people reject him. And then furthermore, in Revelation of the Mystery, he's teaching what his hidden wisdom was, what his purpose was from the beginning. And so as Paul writes this section of Romans, he's going through that. Romans 1, he even says, from the, the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world, they were without excuse. And he talks about this. So he's starting back in Genesis, how there's things God was doing there that made men without excuse. And how do you know that? Because there's no Jews back there. There's no Israel back there. There's no law given from God back there. But they were still sinners. Romans 2, it's talking about people who have the law, Jews. He creates this nation of people, gives them the law. It's Exodus, Deuteronomy, and all that. And there's lessons that, that we can learn from knowing that back there. And he quotes prophecies. He quotes laws back there in Romans 2. Okay? 
Then in Romans 3, he concludes, quoting about seven or eight different prophecies from the Old Testament, talking about how people are wicked and sinners. Right? As a conclusion to, to this teaching that all are sinners. And really what you, you could do, and again, this is just a, a summary and a generalization of these sections, is call this the Old Testament. That's <laughs> what you could do. The lesson that you're learning here, that we're all sinners, is what you learn from learning the lessons of the Old Testament. Right? Well, what do you call this then? 3 through 5, New Testament. You say, whoa, Justin, I know we, we, we rightly divide the Scripture. We're not under the New Testament, we're under the New Covenant. But what happens in the New Testament portion of your Bible? What did Jesus say he came to do in John chapter 3? To condemn the world? No, that was the Old Testament. He came to bring salvation, right? And salvation's in him. Now, it wasn't yet known how he would do that. And that's part of that relation of the mystery. But Jesus comes in Matthew, Matthew, and John, and he's preaching salvation according to the kingdom. And then he dies for sins, which is a part of we know. We know is a part of that salvation purpose. He raises from the dead in Matthew, Luke, and John, which we now know is part of that salvation purpose. And so this, this idea of Jesus being a sacrifice for sins, an atonement for sins, even the book of Hebrews talks about that, sacrifice and atonement for sins. Well, so does Paul in Romans chapter 3. In fact, we'll cover when we get there how some of the language Paul uses in Romans 3 sounds like he's talking to Jews or something. It's not that Paul doesn't have knowledge of the mystery. He's, in fact, using his knowledge of God's manifold wisdom and purpose from before the world began to communicate the lessons of the Scripture from the Old Testament to when Jesus came in the New Testament. And, of course, he's arguing we're justified by faith as well. But, you know, so was Abraham justified by faith, right? So Romans 4, he says, we know Abraham learned something about justification by faith, and David was imputed, uh, didn't have his sins imputed to him. That's the same argument you'd make to a Jew in the New Testament, wouldn't you? You'd talk to a Jew who's struggling with the Old and New Testament and say, listen, listen, Israel, okay, your own scriptures teach that you can't be justified by the works of the law, you have to be justified by faith, and you need the Messiah and his sacrifice to pay for your sins. You need that. Isn't that New Testament argumentation? If you really understood Romans 3 through 5 and what Paul's doing in this way of looking at it, 2 Corinthians 3, 6 is a whole lot easier, right? Right, writers have a big question about 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Some of you didn't know what I'm talking about, some of you do. Where Paul says, God has made, made us <clears throat> able ministers of the New Testament. Well, wait a minute, are we New Testament ministers? Well, if you're reading Romans 1 through 8, you better, better understand how you learned the lesson of the law in order to understand salvation needs Christ and needs justification by faith, which is the New Testament for Israel. You know, we have the same justification by faith, only without a covenant. We don't have to be Israel to get it. And Paul explains that in Romans 4 and 5 and 6. You know, we're, we're, we're something else. Who are we exactly? Do you see this? The difference between the New Testament and us is that we are different people. Yeah. Like he's made them Israel. He's made us what? That's Romans 5 through 8. When you want to know, well, who are we exactly? How, how is it that we're different than Israel? Romans 5 through 8 explains this. Okay? You're not under the law. You're not walking after the flesh. You're a sort of righteousness by faith, baptized into Christ, not into a covenant. <laughs> right? And so you see, he lays out very clearly this argumentation. And so if this is Old Testament, and this is, I know I'm being very general in, here in summary, is New Testament lessons, then this is definitely smack dab mystery information. You do not find Romans 5 through 8 doctrine anywhere in the Old Testament. Walking by the Spirit in Romans 8 is nowhere found in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit's there, but not how to walk after him as in everybody can. You don't find Romans 5 when it says that there's Adam back there and everyone's born in Adam a sinner. But now, Paul is saying, you're in Christ by faith. Well, what is that? You don't find that back in the Old Testament. You don't even find that in Hebrews. But you find it in Romans 5 through 8. Paul's explaining mystery truths here. You see? And so you can see in one way of looking at these three sections is a progression, progression revelation of the Scripture. The lessons of the Old Testament, of Israel, the lessons of Christ coming and what he would do there, and the lessons of the mystery, mystery of Christ and what he did for us specifically. Right? That's why when you read Romans 3 and 4, he's quoting a lot of prophecy. It's still to you, folks. It's still, you can still learn stuff from it, but it's like he's quoting Old Testament, you know. Teaching lessons that the Old Testament would teach about the need for something better, the need for something else. But Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, there's no Israel there. Right? But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. So that's one way to look at those, those three sections. Another way, <clears throat> let's... Another way to look at this, summarize it. Again, I'm, I'm repeating this over and over again, because like I said, we need to know what Romans teaches. And so I want to ingrain it in your head, the very first lesson here, of what these chapters are dealing with. This is what we're going to be teaching the next months. It's going through it a lot slower than we're going through it tonight. But you have to have the big picture in your head. Just like a dispensational chart. You've got to have the big picture if we can go down and look at the details, or you won't understand what's going on. Right? 
And so Romans 1 through 3, if you look at it, it's teaching the lesson that we're all sinners, or kind of like Old Testament lessons, something like that. You can also say it's the cross prophesied. Okay. In thinking of the cross as a theme throughout this section, uh, Jesus' death on the cross was not known in the Old Testament. It wasn't something that they were back there waiting for Jesus dying on the cross. They didn't know anything about it. Right? There was prophecy after prophecy about it. But there were prophecies about sinners, and prophecies about sacrifices, and prophecies about Jesus dying. They just didn't know when and why and how. Right? But the cross was prophesied back here. We have a prophesied cross. In fact, like I said in Romans chapter 3, uh, Paul quotes about seven different Old Testament scriptures in Romans 3, who conclude that you're all sinners, right? everybody's a sinner, and you end up killing Christ is what happens. Right? Isn't that what they did? 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, God was in Christ not imputing their trespasses unto them. The them in that verse were the people who were all sinners killing him on a cross. Yeah. Right? So you have prophecy back here about the cross, though they didn't understand it. It was prophesied. Well, when did all those prophecies come to fulfillment? We have the cross explained right here. The cross explained. Now, this is where, like I said, you, these are very general uh, summaries of, of these sections, okay? So you can be dogmatic in, in every verse about every little thing here. But in Romans 3, Paul's explaining, but now righteousness without the law. And he goes on to explain how you get righteousness. Well, it's not by the law, not by the covenants. It's through the cross work of Christ. And so in this section, Romans 3 through 5, he's explaining the cross. Jesus also died for the New Testament, but he's explaining the cross according to the Revelation of the Mystery as we can now know it. Right? If this is the prophecy of the cross and the need for it, and here is the cross explained after he did it, right? then what's Romans 5 through 8? It would be the cross applied. Okay? And he's saying, well, if this is the finished work of Christ, cross explained, then what does that mean for who you are? Well, that means you're dead with him, and you're risen with him. That means you're dead to the law, because if you're dead in the cross, then you're dead to the law. That means Romans 8, you don't walk into the flesh, because your flesh is dead, because of the cross applied to you. So you see, so you have the cross through here as a theme in Romans 1 through 8. It's something where no one knew it, but you saw it coming, like death, right? Killing things and rejecting God. And then here's the cross explained. Why did he have to die? Romans 3 explains that, right? And then the cross applied to you. And so another way to think about Romans 1 through 8, and again, I, I, repetition's a good teacher, right? That's what we're doing tonight, is righteousness. People often take this as the major theme of Romans, righteousness, because he uses the word quite a bit. More than any other epistle, Paul uses the word righteousness in Romans. And so Romans 1 through 3, what would it be called? It'd be something like your righteousness, right? Or our unrighteousness, really, would be the conclusion there. So it would be unrighteousness of men. Unrighteousness of men. That's Romans 1 through 3. Prove your righteousness. Well, he gave the opportunity Romans 1 through 3. In fact, Romans 1, he gives three times to the Gentiles back there. Prove it, and they don't. He gave them up, gave them up, and gave them over. So Romans 1 through 3 is, is our unrighteousness. Romans 3 through 5 is God's righteousness. How can God be righteous to save anyone in the world if all the world's full of sinners? How can he be a righteous God? He definitely would be a merciful and loving God, but how could he be righteous? How can he be a good judge and do that? But Romans 3 through 5 explains God's righteousness. How can God justify sinners? Later in Romans, Paul will say about Israel that they went about to seek their own righteousness and not the righteousness of God. Well, if you don't learn this first, you won't know what Paul's saying in Romans chapter 10. Right? So he says Israel was seeking their own. Back here in Romans 2 and 3 under the law. They didn't seek God's, which... What was what God promised in the New Testament, what God said he would do for them, but they weren't looking for that. And so when Jesus came, they rejected him. Right? So what then, again, would be Romans 5 through 8? Because if you are justified, declared righteous in Christ by faith, then what's Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 talk about? Well, this is the righteousness of God in you fulfilled. Romans chapter 8 teaches that. It says the righteousness is fulfilled in us who walk after the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Fulfilled in us. And that has nothing to do with it. Now we can do good things where before we couldn't. No, no, no. We learned back here that you can't. <laughs> and God did everything for you. Yeah. But now God can be righteous in justifying you by faith. And therefore God's righteousness is fulfilled in you by faith and in the spirit. Okay. So righteousness is a theme throughout Romans 1 through 8. 
In Romans 1 through 3, we learned a lesson that we're all sinners. It talks about the reprobate mind. So the mind, our mind, is a theme through these chapters. What do we, how do we think about ourselves? Doctrine, of course, is, is just in every chapter in the book of Romans, it's doctrinal. It's, it's teaching. But what are you thinking? What's your mind like back here in Romans 1 3? Well, it's a reprobate mind. Before you know the gospel of salvation, it's a reprobate mind. Ignorant, not knowing certain things. Eyes not open to truth. Seeking your own pursuits and pleasures and values. It's like reprobate mind back here. <clears throat> what happens in this section? You learn something to save you in your mind. So there's a change of mind, yes? What's a change of mind called? Repentance. <laughs> right? So there's our reprobate mind, a change of mind unto salvation, because we've heard something, we learned something, it's changed our mind now. We're trusting God and His righteousness, not to condemn us, which is what it would have done back here, but to save us by the grace of God. And then suddenly over here, what do we learn? Who we are in Christ, from head to toe. We learn the mind of Christ. So now that your mind can be changed by salvation, you can know the mind of Christ. You can't know the mind of Christ unless... <laughs> Your mind has been changed by salvation unless you trust the gospel. And definitely you can't if you're reprobate. Okay, so there's a theme of the mind here in Romans 1 through 8. There's the theme of faith. Faith is throughout Romans, especially Romans 1 through 8. Okay? Romans 1 through 3 is you could argue faith without works. Now, I use that phrase intentionally because not only does it declare we're all sinners, but Paul actually quotes the same thing that James says in Romans chapter 2. Paul says it's not the hearers of the law, it's the doers. Paul says that in Romans 2. Well, James said the same thing in James chapter 1. In fact, James' epistle, half of it's about faith without works. And what does he say about that? Faith without works is dead. What's Paul say about it? Faith without works is dead. Where does Paul go? Further. How faith can save without works. James didn't go here. He didn't know it. Okay. We'll deal with this. We'll get through Romans 3, 4, and 5. James stopped here and says, if your faith is in Jesus as Christ and King and as God in the flesh, you better do what he says. If you don't do what he says, you're not going to get in that kingdom he promised. And Paul says, well, if none of you can. And Paul goes on to explain that faith without works is dead. Because Paul's trying to show that you're all dead. Because you need Christ's finished work on the cross to save you. James didn't have that information about the finished work of Christ. He didn't know how to glory in the cross. There, you, you don't find the cross mentioned once in the epistle of James. Which is why Martin Luther, who read the book of Romans and finished Romans 5.1, this section, he's going, what's the deal with James? You know, he was really frustrated by James. Because James is not arguing against Paul. He's actually arguing something that Paul starts with, and then he, Paul expands. Right? But you see the frustration there to try to reconcile them. But faith without works is dead, Romans 1 through 3. Romans 3 through 5 is justification by faith. How can you be justified by faith? Faith, period. James says, faith without works is dead. You, can be, you have to be justified by faith and works. Paul says, faith without works is dead. And here's how you can be justified by faith. What does Paul teach that James doesn't? What is the work that Paul teaches that James misses? The work of Christ on the cross. And he teaches that sufficient work there. And how then the ungodly can have faith. And so we're justified by faith. And that is the conclusion of Romans 3. Therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith, not by works of the law. Romans 5, 1. Therefore we're justified by faith. That's Romans 3 through 5. Well then what does that mean about Romans 5 through 8? Romans 5 8 through 8 is talking about your, your position, your identity, your sanctification. And your sanctification, again, this is something that hinders many Christians. They think that, okay, I'm justified by faith, not my works. Christ did that thing, but... My sanctification, that's a process that i got to work at. My position, my identity, if I want to be a real Christian, then I need to act like a real Christian first. Well, what if your position, your identity is given to you like it is in your fleshly life when you're born? And that's who you are before you did anything. What if in Christ your identity is given to you when you trust the gospel and you're made a new creature? And that was done by grace through Jesus Christ. You need to learn what that is. So, sanctification is by faith, Romans 5 through 8. There's nothing in Romans 5 through 8 that says, now that you're saved, you've got to do something or else you drop, you drop the ball. And Romans 5 through 8 is, is put, doubling down on faith and grace put, applied to you and your identity and your position. So, we have faith without works over here, justified by faith, and sanctified by faith. Okay? 
which gives us those, also those, those three section uh, descriptions people like to give of condemnation here, justification here, and sanctification here, which is, is accurate. Okay. You can also very, very loosely perhaps talk about Romans 1 through 3 regarding works being what we did and who we were. This being what Christ did and who he was. And this, now who we are now because of what he did. Okay, and so that, that's how you can title and headline those sections. Or, here's the problem, right? Here's the solution, and this is the conclusion. Like, a result of the problem being solved means that you are this now, okay? We could talk about the law in Romans 1 through 8. All through Romans 1. Paul uses the word law more than any other epistle writer in the book of Romans in Romans 1 through 8. Law, 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 law. Paul talks about law everywhere in Romans 1 through 8. Of course, if you know the verses in your head, he says we're not under the law here. This is not by the works of the law. But he mentions that quite a bit. And here he talks about the law of sin and death. The law of sin. The law brings the knowledge of sin. It's the law of sin here. What's here? In Romans 3, he describes the law of faith. A different kind of law. Right? And then over here, it's the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. What's this law that now I'm in Christ? What does that mean? How does that operate? Romans 7, he deals with all that, right? Is, is the law condemning me again? The law of my works? Well, no, it's the law of the Spirit that you're supposed to operate under. So, again, there's laws. There's rules of how God operates in you. Either the law of sin by His external commandments, or the law of faith through faith in Christ Jesus, and the law of the Spirit, which is how you should walk as a Christian now. So, you see, there's, it's very clear those three sections there are divided up, and you can summarize them in many different ways, but all have similar descriptions, don't they? It fits that way. So that's why you should read it over and over again. Maybe look at it in, in, in a different theme or a different way, and you'll see those sections explain this natural progression of understanding of your salvation and who you are in Christ. And then, of course, after that, as we said, he talks about Israel's salvation. Now that you know who you are and how you're saved, the question is natural. What about those people that God gave up? Did he give them up? Are they still around? Is he still doing that? And then over here is your service, Right? Now that you know who you are and you're saved, here is where you put what you know to use. Okay, and that's your service over there. We'll deal with that much later in our verse by verse study. So there's Romans outlined, outlined ten different ways for you. Uh, the same way, ten different descriptions. I want to try to wrap, wrap up tonight's lesson, maybe with some details here about the book. Um, we might finish this some of this next week, but there's some details about the context, dispensationally, the audience. Uh, we've covered the purpose quite a bit and some of the themes. Well, maybe we start at the end here with the themes and purpose, because we, we see that already going through the outline quite a few times here. Uh, themes in the book, obviously, are Paul's gospel is throughout it. In Romans chapter uh, 1, verse 1, he talks about being separated into the gospel. He talks about wanting to preach his gospel in Romans 1, 5 through 8, the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16, Romans 2, 16, all men are judged by my gospel. Right? In fact, he uses that my gospel a couple times. Romans 16, 25, he says, God is able to establish you according to my gospel, right? Romans 15, 16, a, a gospel is given to him. He says, I was a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, that the gospel uh, would, 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 would be preached to them. And so, again, he brings up his gospel in Romans 15. Romans 11, 25 through 28, it's, it's, it's Israel being enemies of the gospel, but not according to election, for the Father's sake. So, the gospel, which gospel it is, and it's being Paul's gospel here, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, is thematic throughout the book of Romans. So by finishing the book of Romans and studying it, you should know the gospel that saves, or the gospel of grace, which is the same thing, or the gospel of Christ, because it's Christ who saves, or the gospel of God, because he dispensed grace and sent Christ. So you, sh you should know the gospel clearly in this dispensation. Um, you also find, as we've, I've mentioned a few of them, the some words that are in your Bible. The, not all these are, are theological terms you learn in seminary. These are from the scripture, uh, which might show the degradation of our vocabularies over, over the centuries. And one of the reasons why people cry out for a Bible in the language of the people, because people just don't know how to speak too good, and so they want a Bible uh, that doesn't have a big vocabulary. And so words like sanctification, justification, imputation, propitiation, atonement, you're going, what? <laughs> Those are big, long words. But they can be understood, and they can be simply understood, you see. And so the, the Romans teaches words like that, about propitiation, redemption, justification, all in Romans 3, 4, 5, imputation, and we'll learn that uh, as we go through these, these verses in, in the gospel.
The words righteousness, as I mentioned already, grace, faith, law, Jew, and Gentile are more mentioned in the book of Romans than any other epistle by Paul, Peter, James, or, or, or John. Okay, all, all the New Testament epistles there, uh, the words are found most in the book of Romans. So again, it, it gives you a theme there of the book about righteousness, grace, faith, laws, Jews, and Gentiles, all in this book written to the Romans. So we, we, we've dealt with themes. Uh, the purpose, if you look at Romans chapter 11, let's turn there real quick. The purpose of the book is to establish. I made a big to-do at the beginning of the lesson about how this book is so essential for Christian faith, and it's, it's the beginning of the gospel. It's an important book that you can read. And, and, and that way, by the way, the most important book you can read in the Scripture means it's the most important book in the world in human history. The Bible is the most important book in the world. And in the Bible, Romans is the most important book that one could read to start out their understanding of the gospel. And um, the purpose, as Paul writes it, as he writes this epistle inspired by God, is to establish these people, which is the very thing I, that we were just talking about. Right? He says in verse 11, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He's trying to get on the same page with these people. He's trying to teach what Christ gave him to communicate and trying to get them on the same page with him, which means on the same page with Christ, to establish them in these doctrines, right? That spiritual gift there, don't get off into the weeds. This is not him saying, I wish I could come and teach you how to speak in tongues. No, the gift is the information, because in Romans 16, it's the spiritual truth he's going to reveal to them. In Romans 16, he, he says now that he's finished the book. Now to God, to him that has a power to establish you according to my gospel. Where do you find that Paul's gospel? In the previous 16 chapters, right? In the Romans. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Where do you find that? In the book of Romans. Which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, particularly in the book of Romans. Okay. And by the scriptures of the prophets. You say, whoa. Well, what, what was in the scriptures of the prophets? According to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the beings of faith. Paul talks about sending the gospel to Gentiles which is exactly what God had purposed for Israel as well, to take salvation to the Gentiles. They just never did. So this is also found in the book of Romans. Okay? So the, the point of him writing this epistle is to establish them in sound doctrine. In Colossians, these later epistles that the church often treats as uh, more advanced or more mature epistles, and rightly so, requires understanding Romans. And Paul even mentions it in these books. Colossians 2, verse 7, or 2, verse 6, from Colossians 2, verse 6. It says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now, Colossians 2 is talking about their walking in the Lord and how to do that and trying to give some more exhortation about that and information. But he says, As ye received him. Well, how did that happen? According to the doctrines of the book of Romans. That's how they got saved, or else they're not saved at all. Okay. That's how they received Christ Jesus the Lord. Then it says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught. Paul didn't teach them that in Colossians 1. You understand? They had already been taught that. Well, what was Paul teaching the Colossians? Or what, what did they hear that established them? Well, it was the same information that he writes to the Romans, which establishes them in the faith. And the Colossians already knew that. And so he's dealing with problems, objections, misapplications, misinformation, further information about what he's already written in Romans. If you don't have Romans, you're missing something when you read Colossians. Okay, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Romans is established. It's fitting that it's in the Bible first in Paul's epistles. It really is. Paul's epistles are, are not in the Bible in chronological order, the order in which they were written, you understand. Um, but there, there is an order, and you, you can figure that out a little bit on your own just by looking at it. But um, Romans is the longest book of Paul's epistles, and, and one of the criteria they used to put the books in the order they did was length of book. And it just so happens that it's, it's the longest book, except for First Corinthians, which is about 20, 20 words longer. But uh, they put it first. It's also the foundational book. And so that, that's why it's there. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 20. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. He's talking about the Ephesians and how they should operate as the church, as members of the body of Christ, one to another. 
and how they should not walk as the other Gentiles walk, but you have not so learned Christ. Well, when did they learn Christ exactly? If they will, it had to be Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Not the basic teachings of Christ. I mean, there are things in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 you're learning. But you have not so learned Christ. He's talking about here harkens back to the foundational teachings of the gospel of Christ. If so be ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now notice what he says here. Here's what Jesus taught you. He taught them, of course, through the doctrine revealed to Paul. Here's what he taught. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Where do you learn that we're all sinners and corrupt? Romans 1 through 3. Where do you learn to put off the former conversation because you're put on something else? In verse 23, you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Where do you learn the teaching to be renewed in the spirit of your mind? You know, Romans 12 says, therefore, being renewed in the spirit of your mind. So that means he's already done it here. It's in Romans. So Ephesians 4, he's harking back saying, you guys haven't learned Christ. Remember how I learned Christ? That we're all corrupt and you need to put off the old man, put on the new man. Romans 6, all throughout Romans 6, about the old man, new man. All right? You see, these doctrines are connected. Like he, he establishes and plants the seeds in Romans for us, and, and then we read in Ephesians, we can grow on it, you see. And then at verse 24, put ye on the new man, which after God is created in righteous and true holiness. That's Romans 6, 7, and 8 right there. Putting on the new man. So you get another summary of Romans 1 through 8. Here's an old man, right? Here's you putting off the old man and putting on a new man over here. And you're learning that. And what happens after you put on the new man? Verse 25, Ephesians 4. Wherefore, after putting off the old and putting on the new, which has to do with your mind being renewed, wherefore, now you've renewed your mind and put on the new man, then you can... Put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. You can actually do some things with it now. Which tells you that putting on the new man is not your change of action, it's your change of mind. Amen. But just as Paul teaches in Romans 12 through 16, there's a reasonable service that results from you changing your mind. Ephesians 4 verse 20, 24. Wherefore? Putting away. See? So in Ephesians and Colossians, these, these more advanced, uh, mature epistles some would say, are called that because they are dealing with issues that people have after they've already been established in Romans. That you take Galatians. Say, what's the Galatian problem? Well, after they've received Jesus Christ by faith and grace, which is, by the way, what you learn in Romans, they think, now I'm made perfect by the law. So they got up through Romans 3, 4, and 5, and they dropped the ball at Romans 6. Or Romans 7, really. The Corinthians, they had a Romans 6 issue. You've heard us talk like that sometimes. We look at the church and the Bible and ourselves thereby to say, well, what, what, where's our problem? Where's our foundational issue? Where do we get off track? And really, you can go back to Romans and figure that out. Maybe we don't think we're sinners. Well, that's a big problem. I mean, you can't even trust the gospel if you don't think that. Maybe we're, we're, we're questioning the resurrection. Well, wait a minute. You can't be saved unless you understand his death and resurrection here. Maybe we think it's faith and works. Well, we're, we're stuck here again, you know. Maybe you think now you're saved by grace. You can do whatever you want. What's well, a Romans 6 problem? Maybe you think now you're saved by grace and you need to do right that the law is going to help you do so. That's a Romans 7 issue. Maybe you think you don't need anything now you're saved by grace. Now you can just do it on your own. You won't have any struggle ever. You got a Romans 8 problem. You need to walk by the Spirit because you're going to get a bump in the road and you're going you're to hit your face in the dirt. You know. So a lot of these problems that we have go back to the foundation of the doctrine that's taught in Romans. The problems that the churches that he wrote to had and, and also that we have as Christians. Okay. This is where, when you, when you see this connection, you see this application to us, even as we walk today, you can see how relevant the Scripture is. The Scripture, when rightly divided, to us today. Romans, through Philemon Paul's epistles, deal with the doctrine, the walk, the, the struggles of Christians today in this dispensation. You go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it does not resonate, folks. Maybe something you want, like you like to walk on water and make bread manifest out of nowhere, uh, but it does not happen. Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah, please, because I don't want to make toast this morning. It's not going to happen. But Romans through Philemon, it's dealing with the actual struggles that we have. See, so, uh, how do you know the Bible's true? Because it speaks truth, reality. But it doesn't if you don't rightly divide, because you, you think it's talking about today when it's not. And you're going, well, see, it doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. You've got to rightly divide the thing first. Romans is the establishment book for the church today. That's where we get our doctrine. Let's see if I can just wrap up a couple more things here. I did the purpose and the theme. We covered the outline. We need to talk briefly about the dispensational context or when the book was written. Often when people introduce books in your Bible, sometimes maybe in your own Bible you have a little preface to the book. 
where the publishers have put in some details about when it was written and from where and things like that. And uh, we can figure some of that stuff out from the scripture. Uh, it's not too important, by the way, if I might remind you, uh, the exact year that Romans was written. And uh, I know that because that's not part of inspired scripture. That's the only reason I know. If it were that important that you know the year in which this epistle was written, then you'd have evidence in the scripture to communicate to you when that was. Okay. If your position doctrinally or from the Bible is dependent upon the year that a book was written and the Bible doesn't declare the year, then you're on really shaky ground doctrinally. Maybe you got your foot on the wrong foundation, right? And so be careful of that. Uh, the Acts 28ers do that. They, 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 their whole position is defined on a time that is not defined in Scripture. It's not looking at the Bible chronologically that's a problem. It's they say, well, we're taking the epistles after Acts 28. Well, how do you know which ones those are? Some of them you can, with high degree of confidence, you can say so. Others, it's very ambiguous. You simply don't know because it doesn't list. You say, well, aren't you doing the same thing? You call yourself mid-Acts. Isn't that a time position? Uh, well, mid actually is very <laughs> ambiguous, so <laughs> it's not very exact. But really what we mean by that is it's when Paul got saved. And that is very clearly known in Scripture. When Christ appeared to Paul, when he got saved, when he wrote epistles, meaning after his ministry and salvation, you know very clearly. It was after Matthew, Matthew Luke, and John. It was, it was after the 12 apostles that commissioned in Matthew 28. You know this. So see, that's a much stronger position than to, right, to make a position off uh, a time not defined in the Scripture. But uh, what's more important than the actual year of when the book was written was when this book was written in the book of Acts. I ran on a whiteboard here tonight, but um, back in our study on the book of Acts, you may recall that one of the purposes that you need to grasp about the book of Acts is that it connects Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with Romans. It's a bridge connecting these two books. And it's not that Romans was written after Acts or anything, it was actually written in the book of Acts. But it, it bridges these two things. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells Jesus the history of Jesus as he came to Israel fulfilling the prophecies, as we're talking about in our Sunday series. Fulfilling the prophecies, he's, he's, he's doing what the scriptures said he needed to do, right? And uh, he leaves the 12 apostles in Jerusalem to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Come to Jerusalem. Come to Israel. That's where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John end with the disciples in Jerusalem. Acts begins then with the disciples in Jerusalem waiting for the prophesied promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to come down, fulfill what was written by the prophets. What's Romans talking about? Paul, an apostle of the Gentiles, who wasn't even an apostle in Matthew, Luke, and John, is going now to the Romans who are in part Gentiles, large part Gentiles, and he's giving them a gospel that was not prophesied in the Old Testament. You see how much different that book is from where these books end? Well, how do we get from here, Jerusalem, to Rome? How do we get there? Now, the, again, I, I somewhat smirk because we've covered this before in 2 Timothy. People think the historical explanation here, how we get to Jerusalem to Rome, is that Peter went from Jerusalem to Rome. But when you read the actual book that describes the transition between Jerusalem and Rome, which is the book of the Acts of the Apostles, you do not find that happening. In fact, the opposite, Peter in Acts 8 stays in Jerusalem. It's Paul that goes to Rome. And Paul goes to Rome when in the book of Acts? very end. It's the last thing he does in the book of Acts. If you've read the book of the Acts of the Apostles, there's a lot of mystery in there about Peter and then Paul, and Paul doesn't get to Rome until the very end. Acts 28, he arrives in Rome finally. It's almost like the, the culmination in the book of Acts is Paul arriving in Rome. And when he arrives in Rome, it's not even him going to Gentiles in Rome, it's him going to Jews in Rome. And he goes to Jews and said, will you guys believe this gospel I'm preaching? And they go, nope. This is my paraphrase. And that's where Paul says, well, that's it then. I guess salvation is going to the Gentiles. We're done with this. And so that tells you the book of Acts is a story of how salvation left Jerusalem, went to Rome, left Israel, went to Gentiles. That's what Acts describes. What's more important than the year in which Romans was written, that epistle, is when in Acts it was written. Yeah. It was written in Acts 2, for example. It'd be pretty close to Jerusalem. It wasn't. Paul wasn't even saved in Acts 2, no. right? Where was it written in Acts? Was it written after Acts 28? Was it written before? Okay. Well, you can find this out. You find this out in verses like Acts 19.21. Look at Acts 19.21. 
There's not much doctrinal significance that comes from you discerning whether Romans was written in the year 56 A.D. or 58 A.D. or 60 A.D. There's not much doctrinal impact that has. But there's a great doctrinal impact it has if you think that Romans was written in Acts 7 or Acts 15 or Acts 20 or Acts 30. You know, there's no Acts 30. There's a doctrinal significance. Acts 19, verse 21, is that where we're at? He says, These things were ended, Paul, and after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to give to Jerusalem, uh, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. This is the first time we find in the book of Acts, in his ministry here, that Paul says, I'm going to Rome. Because Paul didn't start his ministry near Rome. Right. He didn't start it in Jerusalem either, by the way. But he started in Antioch, northwest of Israel, and he started going on these journeys around the Mediterranean. But Rome was like the farthest out of the Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea that you, you could go. And Paul says, at this point in Acts 19, verse 21, I have purposed in the Spirit, I must see Rome. Okay. Now, there's no indication here in the book of Acts that Peter's already there. In fact, he's not. We can know that from the book of Acts. Okay, and it's pretty late in the book of Acts for Peter not to be there, by the way. In Acts 19, 21, he, goes, he says, I don't need to go there. Now, in verse 22, so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, and he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And so, Paul here is purposing to go to Rome. Now, in Acts chapter 20, in verse 1, before he goes to Rome, he goes to Macedonia and Asia, which is where Ephesus is at. And he wants to go back to Rome by going back through Greece and Jerusalem. Acts only verse 1. After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and have given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. That's where Corinth is at. And there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to call into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. Okay, and so it says they accompanied him in Asia, Sopater of Berea, and Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus of Asia, Tychicus of Trophimus. And there, these going forward tarried for us to us. So Paul says, I want to go back <clears throat> through Macedonia. Okay. Look at Romans chapter 16. Essentially, what Paul is saying in Acts 19 21, I want to go see Rome, but he ends up going to Ephesus, and he's going to go back to Corinth, and he's going to go to Rome sometime after that probably via Jerusalem. In the book of Romans, you have some clues in here about where he's writing this epistle from. Romans 16.1. And by the way, the clue is not the postscript at the end of verse 27. We, already, we just talked about those in 2 Timothy 4, didn't we? I gave you the list of all those. and uh, You can't trust the postscripts entirely. They uh, have lots of contradictions to the Bible. Uh, but in Romans 16, you can't trust the text of the Scripture. Romans 16.1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business as she had need of you. So Phoebe, apparently, is going to be delivering this letter. He's sending Phoebe with the epistle of Romans. Phoebe is from where? The church in Centria. Now this is where your maps come in handy in, the old, in your Bible. Okay, Centria is right next door to Corinth. Like Greentown, like Swayze is to Greentown, or Greentown to Kokomo, Centria is to Corinth. And that's how it was. And so Paul's going back to Corinth here. He's writing this letter to the Romans, and he sends Phoebe, who's from the church in Centria, with that. Down to Romans 16, verse uh, 23. <clears throat> he writes in this epistle to Romans, Gaius is mine host. Gaius? Remember Gaius? You've got to pay attention to these names. They help you in these situations like this. And 1 Corinthians 1, he says, I baptize none of you. So Crispus and Gaius, he, he was a Corinthian. Gaius was a Corinthian. And then he says, Romans 16, 23, uh, he, that Gaius salutes you, and Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salutes you. Erastus, didn't we hear about Erastus recently? Oh, just last week exactly. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, Paul mentions Erastus abode in Corinth. So Erastus is from Corinth, Gaius is from Corinth, 
Phoebe's from Centria, which is right next to Corinth, and he's writing a letter saying, I'm living with Gaius, and Erastus is here, and I'm sending Phoebe. Where do you think he's at sending this letter to Rome? Corinth, right? And so in Acts 19 is the earliest he could be writing to Rome, which he said by the Spirit, I must see Rome. Acts 20 is where he's in Corinth. So you must be writing Romans in Acts 20, around verse 2 or 3. He purposes in Acts 19 to go to, uh, to see Rome, but in Acts 19, he's in Ephesus. From Ephesus, he goes to Corinth. And in Corinth, apparently, he stays with Gaius and Erastus and sends Phoebe with this letter they write to the Romans. Because in Romans, this epistle, in Romans 15, he says, I want to come to you guys. You know, I, I, want, I long to see you. I want to come. He said in Romans 1, remember? On Acts 19, he did, that's the first time he desired to see Rome, Acts 19. You see? So you can find things out like that, the context. <clears throat> That's important, by the way. I mentioned to you the doctrinal import of this, which we might cover more next week because there's more to talk about that. But since it's written in Acts 20, that means things have already happened. Like Peter, for example. Paul already talked to Peter, and Peter gave Paul the right hands of fellowship. That already happened. Right? That means Paul's already been teaching this gospel. The gospel he's written in this epistle, he's already been teaching in his ministry. This isn't the first time that he got it. He didn't get the revelation of this gospel this night, and then he wrote the epistle. He's been teaching it. Everywhere he goes. He even explained it to Peter. He went to Acts 15. He says, look, Peter, you know, it's by grace we're all saved. You know, buddy. I mean, no, it's 3 through 5. Peter goes, yeah, I guess you're right, Paul. We'll cover some more of this next week. But, um, so we'll finish this first part of the introduction, and we'll pick it up again next week, trying to deal with some of these details of, of why it matters when Paul wrote this, and maybe we'll get to verse 1. Any questions or any comments?